Welcome everyone. I'm Penny Lewis, the Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, Backyard Carbon Sequestration, How You Can Help. This is part of the Focus on Sustainability webinar series developed by a group of organizations known regionally for their quality ecological education. By collaborating on these webinars, we expand the reach of our regional programs. In case you're not familiar with our organizations, they're all largely nonprofit and volunteer groups in the United States. The regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association Sustainability Committee, the Kansas City Native Plant Initiative, and Rescape California. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Adrian Fisher. Adrian is a Chicago area native and is sustainability coordinator at Triton College in River Grove, Illinois. Adrian is in charge of two large rain gardens and a small prairie area that's certified as a monarch way station. She's active in the Chicago Wilderness Initiative, the West Cook Chapter of Wild Ones, and volunteers with the Plants of Concern Rare Plant Monitoring Program in Cook County Forest Preserves. Adrian has trained and volunteered as a University of Illinois Extension Master Gardener and was the native plant buyer for an independent nursery. Her backyard pollinator reserve has been included in Garden Walks and she blogs at eco ecologicalgardening.net and is a featured writer at many sites. Welcome, Adrian. Oh, hey, thanks, Penny. Um, and I would just like to add, uh, this year I also became uh, the steward of uh, 40 acres of forest preserve land next to campus where I work with students on different kinds of projects. So that's, that's also really exciting to me. Um, so yeah, this um, presentation will be in several parts. It'll be a little bit about c climate change, uh, the carbon cycle and carbon sequestration. And then we'll move to healthy soil and how it can remove excess carbon from the air. And it will include a few gardening practices that uh, can help you do this. Um, I should, I'd like to note, note that tomorrow is World Soil Day, uh, focused on healthy soil and soil carbon sequestration. So I guess this is my way of celebrating that. Um, and right now, uh, Right now going on in Poland is the next round of climate talks uh, and natural climate solutions are becoming increasingly important in the world uh, solution to climate change. And that's pretty much what this whole talk will be about. I'd like to start with um, a quote from Aldo Leopold, a great Midwestern conservationist who in the early 20th century worked among other things, worked with farmers to improve their soil during the Dust Bowl years, and then helped invent the science and art of conservation uh, when he was teaching at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right, as well as what is economically expedient. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And ever since I came across Aldo Leopold uh, in my teens, this has been one of my guiding philosophies um, for practically my whole life. Uh, and it is the governing spirit for this talk. Uh, Leopold wrote Sand County Almanac, Almanac, which was published in 1945. And it is still extremely timely and worth reading. Okay, so since this is um, kind of a nationwide talk, I thought I'd start with a little context. I live near the city of Chicago, uh, actually in Oak Park, which is kind of over here to the west. Um, and it, it's a huge city. There's 5.25 million residents just in Cook County, uh, which stretches along Lake Michigan's southwest tip. And it's one of the most populous counties in the US. And the greater metro area includes 8 million people. The motto is herbs and hortus, which means city and a garden. And it might not look like that from um, a picture or if you think about it. But what most people don't know who haven't been here um, 
is that Cook County also includes 68,000 acres of forest preserve. Even though we are home to such a huge human population, it is the most biodiverse county in Illinois because it's where the prairie meets the eastern forest. And because so much of our land has been preserved, 11%, it's actually kind of like a, a beautiful necklace around the inner city area. Um, it, it's, when you fly into Chicago, it's, it's startling because the open country around the metro area is given over to commodity farming and it looks very, very bare. Um, whether whether it's growing green corn or if it's if it's fallow as it is now, uh, and then when you drive go in towards Chicago, whether driving or flying, the biodiversity increases and it's 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 really really quite amazing. Um, we have lakes, we have more glacial moraines, we have forests, we have prairies, and it's all within a short drive of pretty much anyone who lives in the metro area area. This is uh, Palos, which is one of the jewels of the system, uh, and it's half an hour from where I live. So another thing about Illinois that you might like to know is that it has some of the best soil in the world, actually among the top five best prairie soils. It's very deep and rich. And I never thought about it for years. My house, uh, when I got first serious about gardening, is, is built on, it was built in 1904 on prairie soil. The soil is so black and so deep that I've, I don't think I've ever hit subsoil when I've been digging, like to do rhubarb or anything like that. And basically whatever I plant grows. Now, I understand that I'm, I'm really lucky. Um, as I've come to know other people across the country, I realize uh, what true wealth that I have in my little backyard. Uh, but when I started to understand that this legacy might be in trouble was when I was working on a project out in central Illinois, and we were installing some um, small trees along a property line, uh, with a, and I was with a group of folks. And I noticed that on one side, um, where the field is, it was planted to, let's see, is that soy this year? It had, and what the soil was literally gray, it was dusty, it was kind of yellowish brown in parts, and it barely looked like what I thought of as soil. Conversely, in this grassy, grassy area, which had not been planted over in years and years and years and years, and just been grass and occasionally mown, the soil was the kind of good Illinois soil that one would think there would be. It was nice, it was good, it was black. Well, actually, it was very dark brown and because it was a clay loam. But the turf grass was working and acting as a carbon sink because that's one way you tell that there's carbon in soil is if it's got a good dark color. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about this later in the, in the uh, presentation. So now we're going to talk a little bit about climate change, uh, which is on everybody's minds right now. Of course, the IPCC report came out in October, and the U.S. climate assessment came out actually last week. Uh, and it's really worth reading because it's in good readable prose, unlike the IPCC assessment. And it also goes into detail about various regions in the country. So you can, wherever you live, you can look it up online and you can read about what the likely um, impacts are going to be on, on your region, in my case, the Midwest. Both reports emphasize that there are two things that we need to do uh, to solve climate change. And so it seems simple, right? Two parts but each one is pretty complex. The first one is to cut emissions. Right now, we humans globally produce enough carbon dioxide emissions every year to basically almost fill the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes produce 20% of the fresh water available on the planet. They cover a huge, huge area. The issue is that if we want to keep our uh, warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is um, 
what is that, 2.6 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, we have to peak our emissions by 2020 and then cut them in half by 2030. And then by 2050, we should be starting to go to zero emissions. One way we can do that is through um, all of the things that we know about already. Go to renewable energy, help um, you know, get people into better transportation, whether it's electric cars or better public transportation. Uh, uh, insulate our houses. You know, we, we know how to cut emissions, um, but huge is going to re renewable. But the other thing to really keep um, keep the warming to 1.5, uh, much less two, is to sequester carbon. Because right now we're we're putting more carbon into the air than can be easily handled by the carbon cycle. So if we want to go to the carbon cycle, is um, there's not there's always the same amount of carbon on the planet, and it's in different areas. Uh, it is it is uh, in the soil, it's in the oceans, it's in uh, coal and and oil under the under the soil, and it's and it's in rocks. We um, it, there's slow carbon cycling, which is which is basically the the long, 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 actually 100 million years worth of cycling up between the oceans and the rocks and um, fossil fuels and other things like that. There's the short carbon cycle, which is to do with plant life, and that goes in the in the, in a lifetime, and that's really what. Uh, we're working on right now. When you talk about soil carbon sequestration and you talk about um, plants being able to sequester carbon and all of those kinds of things, you're really talking about the, the short carbon cycle. But the thing is, is that the two carbon cycles are linked. So if you can get um, carbon sequestered down into the soil in a more permanent form, it, it slowly starts to join into the slow carbon cycle. All right. So the first question is, uh, does carbon capture work? Well, a lot of schemes have been suggested uh, and for technical uh, uh, methods. In other words, you, if you had a power plant or something like that, you would suck, suck the emissions out of into, into pipes before they could get into the air, and then you would somehow send them down into the earth and sequester it there. This is hugely expensive, and there are very few, probably three or four um, examples around the year, around the world that, that um, works. Actually, there were 17. Another suggestion is called VEX, uh, which would involve growing and burning massive amounts of biofuels while in the process taking farmland out of food production, destroying forests, and wrecking e ecosystems and then magically sequestering the resultant carbon through mechanical means. Um, and if you want to see what the ecosystem destruction might look like, there's recently a New York Times article about oil palm plantations in Borneo, where e local ecosystems were, have been completely replaced with palm oil plantations to the detriment of um, the people and the animals and the other plants that live there. So obviously, I am not in favor of this selection, and uh, and we don't have the technology to do it anyway. And so what that leaves are natural uh, carbon solutions, basically uh, using nature to help us um, get carbon back into the ground and out of the air. And this actually works. Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, the Conference of the Parties that I talked about before acknowledged the role of carbon sinks when protection of forests was included in the agreement. Um, that has come out more lately. The most recently recent report released um, touts natural solutions as a way to carbon sequester carbon, including agroforestry, regenerative agriculture, conservation, restoration, and even um, 
uh, restoring uh, coasts uh, along the uh, water in, in the waters. A recent article in Science Advances says that natural climate solutions for the United States, um, such as reforestation, et cetera, could sequester 21% of emissions in the US, equal to removing all the cars and trucks from the road. So that's actually pretty amazing. Uh, and gardening is a form of agroforestry. It's actually, when you start looking up statistics for land use uh, in the United States, gardening is, is kind of under agriculture. And so in this talk, I'm using examples from agriculture. Uh, and it's, it's helpful to be thinking about how we use land in those kinds of terms. There are 40 million acres of lawn uh, in the US. And so it's worthwhile to say, to think, well, if there's 40 acres, million acres of lawn, how many million acres also are there of all of the different kinds of gardening practices that uh, we engage in? So lots of folks are working on this problem. Um, farmers, scientists, private landowners, uh, and, and even, even gardeners. Another example of how, what a big difference it can make is uh, the Rodale Institute recently published a white paper. And they said that around the globe, we could sequester more than 100% of current annual CO2 emissions with a switch to widely available and inexpensive organic management practices, which we term regenerative organic agriculture. And if you go to the Rodale Institute, site, um, you can find that white paper and, and read it for yourself. It's, it's really pretty exciting. And more and more scientific papers and the popular press are coming out with different discussions about how soil organic um, uh, uh, carbon sequestration really is a viable um, option. And it's local. Wherever you are living, in the United States, there's a different version of this that you can practice. What I do um, here in the Midwest, it's rainy and fertile soil and um, uh, oak flatwoods and um, uh, great, you know, just all those kinds of conditions. My, what I would be doing to, to sequester carbon might be very different from what someone might be doing um, in Colorado or in the Southwest, for example. But there's uh, things that can be done in every region. OK, so how do we do this? Well, it's plants. And basically, uh, it's the first level of the uh, food web. And they are the primary energy producers. They are also the primary carbon sequestration experts. Uh, woodlands store most of their carbon above ground in the woody biomass of the trees. This happens to be uh, a very nice woodland uh, near, near where I live. Uh, it's an open woodland. It's not, a, it's not a huge forest. And forests, of course, sequester even more, more, more carbon. Uh, and as they grow, the bigger they grow, the bigger the trees grow, the older they get, the more carbon they sequester. And then when the trees are cut down, if they're burned, uh, as they decay, they they do release carbon into the air, uh, but there's different ways to think about that because if it's decaying, it's it's forming part of the of the whole ecosystem of the forest. If it's locked up in furniture, that carbon is just sitting there. If you're burning, some people feel that it is carbon neutral. But other people disagree with that, and I'm, I'm not going to get into that um, that discussion. Uh, the second kind of landscape that is good for uh, sequestering carbon are savannas, and savannas are also called oak openings in the Midwest, uh, and they have other names around the world. They, in my area, they are the most biodiverse systems because. Uh, the, of the variety of plant, plant species. And they combine carbon storing, storing methods. They're kind of in between woodlands and prairies. They have widely spaced trees, 
uh, in the 19th century, a, an oak opening was considered uh, a place where the trees were wide enough to drive a wagon and team of horses through. Uh, and only in the past uh, 40 years have savannas really come to be understood as a distinctive landscape and ecosystem type. Uh, in some ways, as I said, more biodiverse than woodlands or prairies, and they feature bimodal carbon sequestration because they, they sequester above and below ground. And they, they feature both prairie species and trees. But they haven't really been much studied in terms of, of their carbon processing. Um, they're not a well understood ecotype, even though they are the most attractive form of landscaping to humans, which is one reason if you go to parks across the United States and indeed around the world, a lot of times what you'll see are widely spaced trees with some kinds of arrangements of grasses and flowers. Uh, in the Midwest, uh, savannas are a fire adapted regime, which is one reason that they stay uh, open and the plants regenerate quickly. For the Midwest uh, and other kinds of grassland, other areas where there are grasslands, uh, prairies are also amazing carbon sequestration systems. As you see, prairies store three-fourths of their carbon below the ground. In Illinois, that's almost 1,000 pounds per acre per year. The roots can go down 20 feet, so you're talking about storing carbon all the way down. One-third of the roots die every year, and so what you've got is biomass that then all the soil critters can uh, get involved with, and the decomposers and the the ones that transform it into to humus, which I'll get into in a, in a little bit. And um, that, that carbon in the prairie starts getting stable, it's deep, and it's one reason area places like uh, Illinois and other Midwest states and other, certain other areas um, in Europe and Asia have such deep soil and good soil because it's just so full of carbon. Okay, so how does this work? How do plants do this wonderful job of uh, taking sunlight, taking carbon out of the air, and combining the two, and then uh, moving that carbon down underground? Well, for one thing, they don't do it alone. Okay, so as we all know, plants photosynthesize, and they turn um, air and, and water into nutrients. Uh, and what what happens is they draw it in, and what they do is they create um, carbon sugars. They take the CO2 through the leaves, the water through leaves and roots. Light powers the photosynthesis, which creates liquid carbon. And that feeds the plant, but some leaks out of the roots. And this is called root, root exudates. And recently, it was discovered that they weren't really leaking. Um, scientists were kind of confused about this because it's like, okay, they're making all this these carbon sugars, and why is some of it, you know, just sort of leaking, you know, sort of like a faucet out of the roots? But it didn't hurt the plants. And what they realized um, is that the root border cells have extra organelles that help make and disperse the exudates. And in fact, 30 per to 40 percent of a plant's photosynthetic production of carbohydrates goes out through their roots. And it also contains amino acids, vitamins, phytochemicals. And what happens is the plants trade all of this for nutrients. Um, and in fact, in healthy cell, they get 80 to 90% of their nutrients this way. And how this works is the mycorrhizal fungi, which attach to the roots, they actually bond with the roots, and then they form long filaments, and they, they attach to other, um, uh, other species, other trees, other plants, and they form uh, what's been called the wood wide web. And that's the mycorrhizal web that, that goes underneath the soil, and plants literally trade, uh, not only do they trade nutrients, but they also trade information with each other through chemical messaging under, underneath the soil through the mycorrhizae. And what the mycorrhizae do is they 
love carbon sugars, so they use the carbon sugars to help themselves grow, and they bring in other nutrients, um, minerals, and uh, other things for the plants from far away. And not only that, in the rhizosphere of the roots of the plants are all kinds of microbes and bacteria that uh, live in this, this whole zone. And they also do things like fix nitrogen that the plants can then use um, and bring in other kinds of nutrients. To go back to the mycorrhizae, as they are um, bringing the nutrients and using the carbon sugar, they, they themselves produce another exudate called glomalin, which is gluey. And that is 30 to 40% carbon. And it's this sticky, sticky stuff that glues together the soil particles, the little sand and clay particles, into large clumps, which are humus, which gives the soil the beautiful, good structure, helps water percolation, helps soil retain water if it needs to, and it adds fertility. And we didn't even discover this until the late 90s. Uh, Dr. Sarah Wright described glomalin and its role. Um, and it's still, uh, soil science is, is in a way very much in its infancy. And if uh, there's anybody who's looking for a new scientific career out there, this, this would be a good one because there's really exciting things going on. Okay, so that's the overview of how the plants and, and the soil community works together to create um, carbon in the soil. So what happens to that carbon? Well, it starts up here where we're making humus that we were just talking about. And gradually, it gets um, translocated down into the deeper, uh, the deeper layers or the deeper horizons of the soil. And this is something that, again, is not well understood at all. But what apparently happens is in healthy soil, the humus moves downward until it gets deep enough to be stable. And the mechanism seems to be that as the top horizon of the soil, you know, the top soil where we all plant our stuff, um, gets saturated, possibly by water, you know, by water, the, the carbon translocates downward. Dissolved organic carbon breaks the, any, what, whatever weak bonds it has formed in the topsoil. And then it gradually fil filtrates downward and rebinds further on. Uh, and this is, this is a process that happens. Uh, gardening and farming practices and also uh, natural areas do this automatically, if, especially if the farming and garden practices are the correct ones, that is. And, but again, we don't really understand how it works that well. However, Anyone who's a gardener uh, knows healthy soil when they see it. It's in good tilth. It's dark. It's crumbly. It's loose. Uh, it's been described as being like dark cottage cheese. It's got good moisture retention and drainage, and it's fertile. It's not all clumped together like clay. It's not all loose and, uh, you know, like sand. Um, and it's, it's really what you want to be gardening it and it's full of carbon because it's the carbon the organic carbon that help and the processes that i've just been describing that help it be that way and so as a gardener you want to do everything you can to help your soil be that way and a lot of traditional practices uh prior to the advent of um, uh, synthetic fertilizer uh, were aimed at creating this kind of soil. And, and when fertilizer came along, uh, people kind of felt like it wasn't, um, they didn't really need to do these things so much, but, but that also um, has created problems. So here's a picture of some farm soil, and you can really see the difference. Here's uh, on the first, on the left hand side is 1% carbon. And on the right-hand side is 5% carbon. And according to Rodale and also the NRCS, farms can see a change from 1% to 
to over 5 to 8% over 10 years simply through changed practices. And I say, why not gardens? I would love to see partnerships between private landowners, botanic gardens, um, university campuses to study uh, gardening practices. What are we doing? Is there a can we show a change over time just in our ornamental gardens, for example? Um, there's no studies on that, and, and I would like to see some. I mean, I, I, can see, I can tell you about some things I've seen personally, but that's not really a study. And here's an example of uh, deep, deep prairie roots. Here's a really nice picture by Jim Richardson up here, and you can see how much more the roots are than the top part. Uh, and that's very common in, in diverse grasslands and prairie areas. And you can see the dark, dark, dark carbon here but the fact that the roots goes down, go down so far means that all that carbon translocation and the mycorrhizae uh, connections are happening at a much deeper level than they are in areas that are just sown to annuals or other, other kinds of plants. And here's just another picture. Uh, I just got this off the internet. Uh, from a soil group I belong to, and this is a, a, a grazer who plants cover crops, and he said that over three years his soil went from this kind of brown stuff, which is very similar to what I was describing in that uh, soybean field, to this very, very black carbon-laden soil. He was, he was digging post holes, and so he just snapped pictures. And so this is another example of, of what can happen. Okay, so the factors that deplete soil health and prevent deep carbon sequestration. Plowing and tilling, bare soil, annuals, limited biodiversity, reduced organic material, synthetic fertilizers, and all pesticides. Plowing and tilling break the mycorrhizal root uh, webs. They expose microbes and all the, the uh, little soil creatures to the air where a lot of them will die. And they also create a kind of emissions in themselves. Nitrogen oxide, uh, NO2, nitrogen oxide, tends to start going up into the air. And when uh, all of, so many fields and gardens are um, laid fallow and their soil is bare for six, eight months during the winter, this also is very detrimental to the soil life because it may freeze. It does, it's not protected from the sun. There's no, um, uh, uh, root uh, rhizosphere because the plants have all been plowed up. Um, and you can actually see in, at, at NASA, the, uh, they have pictures of the world showing um, how carbon is being sequestered across the U.S. during the summer and then when our lands are laid bare, uh, the carbon sequestration stops and other emissions rise. The problem with annuals uh, is that you are, um, again, you're digging up the soil and you're putting in, you're putting in annuals. And, and if you really want to sequester carbon, you have to um, disturb the soil as little po as possible so the biological um, um, activities can go on beneath. Limited biodiversity means, well, monocropping. The more biodiverse a place in terms of its plant life, the more carbon is being sequestered. Because there is competition among species, but there is also cooperation. And each one uses uh, the various nutrients and has different, differently and has different kinds of relationships with um, the other species that are, that are nearby it. And so uh, when you have a field full of corn or you have a, you know, I don't know what, you have a big field or a big area in a garden full of one particular species, uh, you are limiting not only your above ground biodiversity, but your below ground biodiversity. Reduced organic material. Well, we all know now we should be adding compost and we should be doing what we can to put organic material back in the soil. Um, but a lot of gardeners and a lot of farmers still don't do this and they rely on synthetic fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizers. Uh, for one thing, producing synthetic fertilizers has 
causes a lot of emissions on its own. They're made from natural gas. They, the production cycle uses a lot of, of, of fuel. Uh, it, it emits into the atmosphere. And then, and then when you put it in the land, what it does is it, it short circuits the natural activities in the soil. And plants can become addicted to synthetic fertilizers and literally forget how to build, build those relationships with the other living creatures in the soil. And the, and the microbes go crazy on fertilizer. They eat a lot, they die, and then there's not so many of them left. It's just not sustainable. And there are a lot of studies that, that have shown how this happens. Um, there's a big one out of the University of Illinois, for example. And lastly, pesticides. Uh, everyone thinks about the, and has heard about the problems with insecticides, for example, neonics killing pollinators. Um, herbicides are difficult because you might be killing, they can um, collect in the soil. Uh, and fungicides are something that people don't think about, but if you, a lot of them are pre-emergent, and then you're, you are maybe killing useful fungi, such as the mycorrhizae. So they, the synthetic fertilizers and the pesticides tend to serve as, as interrupters to the natural cycles that we would want to be encouraging and thus interrupt the uh, ability of soil to sequester uh, carbon as well as it could. So for gardeners, uh, what you want to do, in my opinion, is mimic the functionality of prairie savannas and woodlands. Now, obviously, if you don't live in that kind of an eco zone, then what you need to do is study where it is you live. What are the native plants? What, how does the ecosystem function? You know, there's a very different uh, protocol for an arid region than a temperate region. But there is a protocol that can be learned. Uh, out in California, I know they use a lot of hedgerows and things like that from with adapted bushes that help uh, sequester carbon and also uh, help native pollinators. And there's other kinds of gardening practices that, that can be done according to region. But basically, what you want to do, as I was saying, is um, encourage biodiversity, uh, you, however it is you do it. And here I've got, these are, in my town, the yards are pretty small. So here someone has, uh, and that's an old time bungalow right there, someone has just planted their front yard uh, with all kinds of native plants. And I just snapped this picture one day when I was on a walk. Um, this is my backyard where I have about 80% uh, native plants, but then I have a few non-natives, um, like my peonies. I'm not going to dig my peonies up just because I, I want to have all native plants. And uh, Doug Tallamy uh, and his um, students and, and colleagues have shown that if you have about 70% native plants, that's enough to support local bird populations and insect populations in some kind of a balance. So that's, that's really important to know. OK, so what else can you do? Armor the soil. You don't want bare soil. You want deep-rooted native perennial plants. You want to keep the soil covered, and you want minimal disturbance. This is a picture under uh, a tree in my yard. I've got, I think, five or six species of native plants there. I've got um, uh, celandine poppies. I've got two kinds of violets. The, the, uh, what else have I got? Virginia water leaf. Um, there's some ginger and native ginger in there. Uh, where you don't see it is some um, uh, wild strawberries and uh, Jacob's ladder. So, so instead of just putting down mulch, you might start with a layer of mulch to help suppress weeds, but then you put in a multi-species what's called living mulch. And I love that description, living mulch, because you are, by doing that, functionally improving the, the network of soil life. And all these plants hook into each other 
uh, through the, the, you know, the wood wide web and they hook in with the trees and they actually benefit each other and the trees. And it's just much better for every, all of it than just using plain mulch. Uh, and that way, even during the winter, you've got the roots, even though these, most of these are, um, deciduous, they still, uh, they're still helping to anchor the soil. And then of course, I have an oak tree, so, Right now, uh, in the autumn, late autumn, my uh, I've got sort of a layer of oak leaves under under there too, and so it makes me happy to walk by there and see everything working together that way. Uh, and then again, minimal disturbance. Um, you know, how can you garden with you know garden as much as you can without without digging? Plant a really good uh, set of plants that are going to last a long time. And then you really can avoid um, doing any kind of, of, of digging for almost years on end. Uh, at least I found that to be uh, true in my in my experience. Um, and it's it's a way that a lot of people garden today anyway. But to be doing it more consciously um, is something that I think is is new. At least. Um, it used to be in evidence, I think, maybe before World War II, before the synthetic fertilizers and insecticides came in, but we're, we're learning it again, I think. So, secondly, we should use organic inputs, no pesticides, no synthetic fertilizer, and plenty of organic matter. Uh, I myself have a compost heap and every, um, you know, I'm constant, every spring I put a little layer of compost down and it seems to help the soil in general. The other thing to, to me is very expensive is to consider the needs of species such as bumblebees, birds, and other wildlife. And I alluded to that a moment ago when I said you should, you should strive for 70% native species. Uh, but it's also um, gardening with Say, if you're planting native flowers, what are the native flowers that uh, monarchs prefer? What, what colors do hummingbirds prefer? Uh, do you have um, composites that are good for short-tongued bees as well as uh, longer, deeper flowers that are better for long-term bees, long, long-tongued bees? It's those kinds of, of thinking in terms of wildlife beyond just what flowers do I, the gardener, think are pretty? And it's pos and of course, you know, this can make a very beautiful landscape. Um, but but that's something I'm I'm always thinking about. You know, are the bees going to like this? Because the bees are actually uh, kind of like the canary in the coal mine. If you've got pollinate a lot of pollinators in your garden, then you are definitely doing something right. If you don't have so many, then you know work work should be done. And that's how I first discovered. I wasn't even interested in bees when I was younger. And then as I started gardening with native plants, I started noticing all these things flying around. And then the birds started coming. And it was really pretty remarkable uh, what, what will happen if you just plant the, um, the right kinds of plants. All right, I'm going to briefly talk about lawns. Because I said lawns can be carbon sinks if they are uh, cared for correctly. The lawn, I said it was 40 million acres. It's 5% of the land in the US. And lawn is actually the largest crop in the United States, which is kind of odd to think about. Um, the, this picture is a scientific model showing where turf grass can go, grow really well, pretty much without inputs. And I am here to tell you, being from Chicago, that Yes, grass will grow wherever you don't want it, in your garden, in your in beds. Uh, it'll just grow by itself. Um, but it does, it does like to be um, nurtured a little bit. Uh, and I have heard from certain people in other parts of the country, say down here in hillier areas where, you know, and, and of course there's Kentucky bluegrass where grass grows well too. Uh, but this is just a, a, a model. If you're trying to grow grass out here in the Four Corners in Colorado, it's pretty dry out there. Turf grass is going to take a lot of water. Uh, and in this era of water shortages, maybe that's something to consider in, in your landscaping. 
uh, and here is a picture of all those prairie plants I was telling you about. And here, right here, is grass. Grass has roots, as you know, about, I don't know, four inches. So they don't, they, they can sequester carbon. And if it's, if it's undisturbed, it, it's gonna, it's gonna help keep the soil on this, you know, uh, quiet and the, and, and, but it's still not as valuable as biodiversity. Now, how can you increase grasses' um, ability to store carbon? Uh, one solution is the polyculture lawn, uh, AKA growing other things that aren't grass in your lawn. Now, I know that a lot of folks get upset by this. Uh, in Oak Park, we had a robust discussion uh, regarding with some um, congregations, among some congregations who are trying to go green, but they just couldn't lay off the lawn chemicals uh, for, for reasons of neatness. Um, but if you grow clover in your lawn, it, clover is kind of amazing because what it does is it uh, is a perennial legume and it has it fixes nitrogen and it helps the grass stay green. The roots go down uh, sometimes as much as two feet. And so if you have a clover lawn, not only are you helping the bees, but you are helping your grass and it, and it will stay greener longer and you don't have to water it so much. Uh, again, I'm not sure how this works in certain areas, but I know that it does work in the Midwest. Or you can um, use small flowering bulbs. Uh, I grow snowdrops in my, in my lawn and the bees actually go to them early in, in the season. Uh, and this bumblebee is just sort of a, I have it in there kind of as a joke because that of course is Creeping Charlie, which pretty much everybody hates, but it's a very useful um, plant for bees early in the spring, even though it's non-native. Uh, and it's, it's difficult. You know, Creeping Charlie won't grow so much in uh, grass that is uh, sunlit and uh, at a proper moisture level. It loves damp shade uh, areas where it's kind of hard to grow grass anyway. And so Creeping Charlie, it's very easy creeping ch for Creeping to Charlie to get in there. And I don't have any good answers. Uh, it doesn't, it's pretty much impervious to a lot of pesticides. So. Anyway, uh, regenerative gardening is already making a difference. This is a Midwest garden full of um, butterfly weed and bee balm, and uh, there's some sylphium growing in the in the back left. And uh, it's got uh, the grass is just where it's needed, and no more. And it is it is a polyculture lawn, uh, so I have that for kind of um, inspiration. And regenerative gardening practices are, are making a difference. There's the way we garden now is vastly different from the way people were gardening in the 1960s, for example. Uh, and there's a wonderful book out um, by Claudia West and Thomas Rayner called uh, Planting in a Post Wild World, which talks a lot about all the kinds of practices which will help you garden in this in this kind of sustainable way. They don't really talk about uh, carbon sequestration, but the kind of gardening that they're talking about uh, will automatically be doing the kind of carbon sequestration that, that you would want to be doing if you're interested in helping um, mitigate climate change in the world. Uh, so just a couple other inspirational pictures. This is, as I said, a lot of a lot of manicured suburbs look a little bit like this, and it's the kind of what I think of as the faux savanna, where you've got some trees, you've got a few flowers, and you've got a lot of turf grass. Uh, but to me personally, this is in, in a Chicago suburb. This is a red oak right there, a young red oak, and uh, you can see the wild geranium, and you can see the sedges, and you can see uh, grasses, and and it's not where people are trying to walk, and some people might think it looks messy, but I, I think it, it looks really great, and it's uh, sequestering a lot of carbon. Now, some people ask or have asked, what happens, you know, how do you avoid disturbing your tree roots, let's say, when you want to put fl plant flowers around? Because we've all been hurt, we've all heard, you know, once your tree is growing, if you want to plant 
shrubs or flowers are going to disturb the tree roots. Well, one way to avoid that is to kind of plan out what you're doing. If you're putting in a young tree, at the same time, uh, plan out the, the, the living mulch you're going to put around it and try to install it all pretty much at the same time or within a couple of years, especially if you're doing shrubs. Um, I've planted uh, a lot of young native plants, just plugs around trees without doing the trees any harm. And then what I do is I mulch around them and then gradually the native plants kind of spread and take over and then you don't have to mulch anymore. Um, although unfortunately, weeding is always present as we all know. Um, another example, this actually could look very much like my, my brother's yard, again, a suburban landscape. Uh, this is what I call a mulch garden, where the mulch is one of the di dominant features of the landscape. Uh, you can go to um, the Botanic Garden in Chicago, and you can see something like this. This is very oh, another wonderful example of how you add biodiversity and you can make it neat. Let's say you're in an area where people might think that, that wild is, is messy and, and, and maybe they're made uncomfortable by it. So you add in a little fence or, and, a, and a brick uh, edging or something else like that. Or maybe you put in your, your uh, monarch way station sign to show that this is all intentional and purpose, purposeful. Uh, and or maybe some plant labels and and then everything suddenly looks better to people's eyes because it's intentional um, but at the same time you know that you're helping wildlife you're helping pollinators you're storing carbon and you're benefiting the ecosystem in all kinds of ways uh, so every you know everybody wins in that case um, now, I've been asked uh, to say when I'm about three slides from the end, um, we're coming to the end of the talk, which is this. And if you have any more questions, you should submit them now. Um, and then uh, we'll have a, a, a short question and answer session at the end. So this is just my students at Triton where I work. And this is a pocket prairie that uh, we started about eight years ago. Uh, it's now a monarch. Uh, uh, way station and I just I just love my students because they teach me and I just really enjoy being outside with them and and doing outdoor outdoor projects so I always have to every talk I give I give a shout out to my students uh, if you want resources at my blog ecological gardening um, I have a tab at the top of the page and I'm always adding to it it's a mix of uh, books films scientific papers, uh, sometimes articles, just whatever I come across uh, that seems relevant. And it's also material that I've drawn on for, for, my, for this talk and other talks. So that's it. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Adrian. We have time for a very few questions. Can you just very briefly describe what a savanna was that you mentioned early in your talk? Oh yeah. Okay. So a savanna is an area of of land um, that is, has a combination of widely spaced trees, and between the widely spaced trees are all kinds of grasses and flowers. And in the Midwest, those widely spaced trees are likely to be bur oaks because they are fire adapted. So if a fire goes through the savanna, the bur oaks survive, uh, and they're a very um, very fertile kind of and wonderful kind of landscape. All right. Can you repeat what university it was that did the study on synthetic fertilizers? Oh, yeah. That's, um, that's the University of Illinois. And they did the study on the Morrow plots. Uh, and uh, I do have a PDF of an article about that uh, in my resources page. I could just wait. It's because they followed these plots over a, literally a hundred years and found some very interesting things out. Can you repeat the different types of plants that you talked about as living mulch, and in particular, anything, any recommendation for the Pacific Northwest? Oh, 
okay, sorry. <laughs> That's, um, I'd love to go there someday. Um, it's actually what I think in general what you can say is is what I'm really talking a little bit about is what is called a, a forest garden. And under my trees are understory plants that you would find out in the forest preserves, the violets and the celandine poppies and, and, and um, wild strawberries and native ginger uh, and Jacob's ladder and, and uh, wild um, columbines. You know, those are all plants that if I go out in the woods, I'll find them out there under trees. And so my advice would be to find out what native grows native around where you live in the woods, if that's what you're doing is creating a like a woodland garden, and then use those species to uh, to to grow around around your trees or among your trees. Next question: Are you aware of any incentive programs to help get homeowners to do more with native plants? No, and I wish there were because uh, uh, it would just be. It would just be really helpful. I know that there are uh, organizations like like uh, ELA, and also I belong to Wild Ones, which is a homeowners, you know, for for private landowners who want to work with native plants. But uh, I I know of no initiatives. It may be that that homeowners associations or other groups like that could possibly band together to get uh, a grant maybe from a state agency or fish and wildlife, but I really, I don't know about that. And it would be nice. Okay. Uh, next question is about covering vegetable garden soil in the winter. Do you have recommendations? Um, well, it depends on how big your, 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 veg, your vegetable garden is. I have a, a small one and what I do Pretty frequently, I've tried different things. I've covered it with a straw mulch um, some winters, and the last couple winters, what I've been doing is putting down uh, a layer of uh, leaves, uh, oak and maple, because that's what I have, and then covering that with a layer of wood chips. Uh, and then in the spring, when I'm ready to plant, I I kind of push that aside so that I can put my my plants in, and then it's already pre-mulched, you know. Um, um, that works pretty well, but I, I think each solution like that is just some places. If you have a big garden, you might want to try growing a cover crop. Uh, uh, you know, winter kill something that would be like winter killed uh, oats or something like that. There's a there's a whole literature on that. All right, thank you. And we only have time for one last question. What influence do invasive plants have on carbon sequestration? Oh, well, uh, again, I, I am most familiar with my own little piece of the world. Uh, in the woods where I work, uh, invasive buckthorn disturbs the whole ecology. The roots send out chemicals that are inhospitable to the native soil life. The, it grows in such a way that it shuts off light to the understory so then the all the little beautiful little flower spring flowers and things don't grow and also uh, young oak trees cannot regenerate um it, it it so basically it does that and it stays it greens up faster and stays green longer than um uh, most native plants and the berries are very attractive to birds, but they are very bad for the birds, and so they it makes them sick to their stomachs. So it's that kind of a, an invasive plant like that will have destructive effects on the whole ecosystem, and then um, that affects because it disturbs the balance of of the ecosystem. Then the ecosystem cannot the plants in the ecosystem cannot you know, the carbon can't be stored and sequestered in the way that would be, it normally would be because of all these different factors. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, Adrian. You've given us a lot of really 
compelling evidence for why we should be getting out there and trying to make a difference in our own backyards. Thank you again, Adrian, for your time and sharing all of this information. Oh, thank you. I was thrilled to be able to do this, actually. <laughs>